As we look into God's Word today, let's think about this question. How do I feel about being in God's presence? I'm not necessarily talking about in heaven someday by and by, but I'm talking about even now, do I sense a closeness with God, and how do I feel about that? Exodus 33 is our passage for today. Exodus 33, we're going to look at the story of Moses in God's presence, and you actually see several different uh, responses to God's glory. And so I want to touch on that for just a little bit here this morning. Exodus 33, verse number 12, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, this is our text verse today, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Or at least that's a key part of that as well. Let's go a little bit further. Verse 16, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And Moses said, I'm sorry, and the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And that last phrase, of course, going back, uh, connected with verse 15, would be our key thought today. Show me thy glory. Don't let me go anywhere unless I am in your presence. Help me to know right now, today, that you're here and that you're working in my life. I'm going to talk about that for just a few moments. Let's pray together, first of all. Dear Lord, we do need your help. We need your glory, your presence among us. Will you stir us again this morning and accomplish your purpose in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we think about the glory of God, maybe we would go back pretty pretty commonly into sort of the distant, somewhat distant past, uh, as far as our nation's concerned. We go back to uh, the latter part of the 1800s, the 19th century, and uh, it was a period that was known for its great revival. It seemed like there were several awakenings throughout the 1800s, uh, or at least we, we, many times we might think of it as at least a couple of those times, and uh, it involved men like Charles D. Finney or D.L. Moody. And so those are sort of common names, in, in Finney's case at least. There's some amazing stories that go with that. I'd encourage you to read his, his uh, story. I, I can't remember, it probably as a biography, but, but maybe autobiography, I can't remember now. But anyway, it seemed like God's presence would just come in remarkable ways under his ministry, and, and really it was a result of collective prayer to that end. The royally minded crowds would soon rise up in opposition because they didn't, they didn't like to be called out. They didn't like to, to feel uncomfortable in God's presence, and certainly God's presence was all around. But before very long, even the opposition, they'd be battling on their knees in repentance because God's presence was so real, it was like they couldn't, just scarcely could resist. And I believe at least part of the story was that those who did resist didn't find themselves living very long. And so uh, at different times, I think there, was, there were times where people would maybe come from a distant town, and even when they got into the town limits or whatever, just right there in the, in the vicinity, they begin to all, already sense God's presence in such a real way. And one story in particular that I remember of was where uh, Finney had gone into a factory, and, and uh, just as he walked among the workers, he wasn't preaching or anything, but just he was walking amongst them, a little bit there, and, and they were falling on their knees in, in seeking after God because they were so impacted by the power of God. So this morning, maybe we ought to ask what we know about God. What do we know about His presence? Do we sense His presence in a regular, in a regular way? When I say that, maybe I should say extraordinary way on a regular basis. Do we, do we sense that He's near? 
Do we, do we feel that he has come among us and he's dealing with our hearts? He's, he's giving us a, a desire to serve him. Maybe sometimes even his presence is so real that he starts to kind of prick at our conscience. What is our attitude when we think about facing him or being in his presence? I read an article sometime back now about churches that uh, are becoming extinct. And, and there are. There are many uh, churches every year, I think, is somewhere close around 10,000 churches, perhaps, that are, are closing. That may not be a current figure, but, but I believe that was what it was at one point. And there were several features of those churches. And let me just share one of those. It was the last one. Maybe it would be the basis for the others, actually. It was how the glory was dying off. And because the glory of God was no longer there, a little bit kind of harken back to the temple there where Jesus said to, to the, uh, the people around there, the Pharisees in particular, he's saying, your house, supposed to be God's house, but your house is left unto you desolate. That temple that you had such confidence in that you thought was going to be, you know, would be your claim to faith. Oh, no, God has deserted you. God has left you to go on with your worship because you have pushed him out. And maybe that's current even in our day as well. Maybe sometimes we feel uncomfortable in God's presence. And so we really don't want him to come in, in real special ways. Oh, we, we still have revival. And of course, we plan to. But as we do that, maybe we would also need to just kind of take stock a little bit. Do we really want revival? Are we really looking for God's presence to be here? We need to be. We need to be focused on that. But what do we mean by the glory, quote unquote, the glory? What is that supposed to mean? What are we, what are we talking about here? Well, very simply put, I suppose, it's just simply that we sense a, a special presence of God among us, a special, maybe I could say a special sense of God's presence, the power that blesses some, that humbles others, Maybe maybe would humble all of us, actually. Maybe, maybe we would say convicts some. That, that sense that there's something special here. This is not just what the preacher's cooked up, or not just because it's a, a song with great uh, music that just moves us, but it's just that God's presence is, is among us in a special way. When God truly meets with us, we recognize his majesty, we recognize his holiness, it stirs our heart. Moses knew a little bit about this. Moses had been in God's presence. And if you will go back even in the, in the thought, back in Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 6, Moses was afraid to look on God. Moses was afraid in God's presence. He didn't feel comfortable. But in this case, over here now in chapter 33, something has happened in the in the middle time there, in the intervening time, and now you see that, that Moses is comfortable here. Too often, you know, we're content with our programs and, and our own efforts and all those things, but really without the glory of God among us, then really we ought to feel like Moses even in verse 15. Or don't take us anywhere if your presence isn't with us. We don't. We don't want to try it on our own. We don't want to try to somehow manufacture something. And really, how can we attempt anything unless God's with us? Unless he helps us. I, I know, I understand. There are, some, there are some ministries, maybe, or movements that are built on people. But ultimately, it's not going to last. We have to have God move among us. It's all in vain without him. So this morning, let's remember that we need his presence. And we're not talking about some sort of demonstration necessarily. That's, that's, the, that's he might say, the, the result of the, the symptoms of revival, of a stirring of God, of God's presence among us. That, that's what happens, but, but we're not looking for a demonstration. We're just looking for God to be here. We're looking for his presence to be among us. We need that genuine contact with God in which he just transforms us, he, he sets us aglow, and he helps us to be, to be uh, encouraged in him, yes, but also humbled in his presence. 
So how can we experience this special presence of God that we call the glory? What does it require of me? Just very quickly, I wanted to give you three things that I believe the glory, if we want God's presence among us, what the glory requires. The first is that it requires an in-depth inspection of my own heart. It's going to require me to be honest with God. Again, we go back to what, what Moses was, was feeling. Let's actually go back there for just a moment. In Exodus 3, and verse number 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And so as we think about this truth today, it does require an in-depth inspection of my own soul. Now, I can't say all about Moses' spiritual condition at that moment, but I am here to say that, they, that he, he was not comfortable in God's presence in that case. And then later on here, he's on the mountain. He wants God to, to go with him. He's, he's feeling that, that he just, well, in fact, is he? I think he spent 40 days and 40 nights there on the mountain with God. And when he came down, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but when he came down, he had such a glow of God on his face. Oh, now he was comfortable. Now he was close, but it required an inspection. This was very similar location to where he had previously met God at the burning bush, where he previously knew that God was there. And now he has a heart that's right with God and he can enjoy his presence. You ever found yourself kind of feeling like, you know, everybody else seems to be getting blessed and I just, uh, I don't really like those services. I don't like whenever I feel that way. Maybe it's because you need to do a heart inspection. Lord, what's, what's wrong inside that I wouldn't long for your closeness? Second thing I want to notice with you quickly is that it requires an individual investment. We've done the inspection now. We've, we've searched our heart. But now I have to invest in God's presence. Am I just passive and you know, do I just cut the church and think, well, I hope, I hope God meets with us today. I hope somebody's prayed up. I, I hope I can really sense God's presence. Or have I been earnestly longing for it and looking for it and praying for it? You see, if I'm just passive, really, I, I suppose what happens is that we, if we're all passive, it just kind of it falls by the wayside. And nobody's doing the effort to pray it into, into existence. And we have to be men and women of prayer who are seeking after God until he comes among us. And it requires an active pursuing after God. As Moses spent time, he, of course, he had climbed the mountain there. He had spent time with God. He was cultivating a relationship that allowed him to really, truly experience God's presence. Even to the point of seeing his back. Remember how he said, show me thy glory or something to that effect. I'm not sure. Is it right here? Uh, yes, actually it is in the next few verses that it says uh, that he would be able to see his face, but uh, he would put him there in the rock, he'd cover him, and then he would be able to see his back parts. Verse 23, but my face shall not be seen. So that's where he gets to from, from being afraid to look on God, from being afraid to see God's presence, then to long for it and to glow from it and to actually be able to look upon God. God in some measure, but it requires some individual investment. You and I will not be able to be in that place or experience that glory unless we have invested time in seeking after God. It requires some time. It requires prayer. It requires some humility. We need to make the individual investment. Don't count on everybody else to help you feel good in church. Now, really, sometimes churches, maybe best, the best church services maybe are not necessary to make us feel good. Oh, I know, we, we, we need encouragement as well. But sometimes the best services may make us feel humbled before God and maybe in awe in his presence. And, and there is, if you're, if you're right with God, then that does feel good. But it's not in hilarity many times. But it's just that, that sweetness. I've been in a service before uh, several years back, I guess now, that uh, we didn't really, really want to do anything. Scarcely. Well, once in a while we might sing a chorus or something, but it was just, I just sat down and we just, we just waited. 
We didn't really feel comfortable to leave. It wasn't in hilarity, but it was a sweet sense of God's presence. But it requires individual investment. Am I ready to do whatever it takes to hear from God, to know his closeness, to see his glory, to know that he is at work? In-depth inspection, first of all, and then individual investment. The last thing I would notice with you, and I've already touched on it, but I want to mention it to you as well. It results in an inescapable identity. An inescapable identity. How do we see that? Well, whenever Moses came down. When Moses came down off the mountain there. He had such a glow of God about him that he apparently, you know, as we might say in our day, they needed shades to be able to even handle the glow. It was so bright. They made him, I don't know who came up with the idea, but I, at least that's what, what happened. Moses hid his face. He, he covered it with a veil because they couldn't handle it. He shone because he had been with God. And so the question this morning is, do I shine for God or shun him? Do people see Jesus in me? Is there something that I can't hide because I've been in God's presence? If you go over, uh, let me just go back to t- just touching on Moses here real quick. The shining face is the latter part of chapter 34. Let me just mention it here real quick. The skin of his face shown, that's verse 30. And then, um, let me try to get this right. Uh, yes, okay, the end of verse 30. And they were afraid to come nigh him. Now the people are afraid, not just in God's presence, but in Moses' presence, because Moses had been with God. Have you ever known somebody like that? You almost... Almost, if, if you weren't right with God, at least I'll put it this way, if you, if you weren't really sure that you were right with God, then maybe you were a little afraid to get near somebody. And maybe you see them uh, over here coming uh, kind of your direction. You kind of make sure you're going this way. If they're in the store, you know, you make sure, oh, I don't want to go down that aisle. Why is that? Because when somebody has God's presence on them, and if you're not right with God, it kind of shines off on you. It, it kind of it kind of impacts you even through their own life. People ought to recognize when we've spent time with God. People ought to recognize whenever we are God's people. There should be a beauty of Jesus that shines on us. Let me just give you a quick example, and we'll try to bring it to a close. Years ago in the, uh, I guess it would be the gold rush time frame, time frame, there's a group of prospectors. They set out from uh, Bannock, Montana, which I think maybe at the time was the capital of Montana. At any rate, whether it was or not, it seemed like that's, that was what it was. And um, they, they set out, these were, were gold prospectors. They were heading out into the, the wilderness there. And they had faced terrible hardship and discouragement. All sorts of terrible things had, had gone wrong. Finally, they just were, <laughs> they were at their ropes end, so to speak, their wits end. And uh, they're, they're just, they're tired, they're weary. They're discouraged. They're going to head back to Bannock in defeat. But on the way, they, they tethered their few limping ponies near a creek, and one of them found a curious rock in the water. And as they, he shared it with the others, and they began checking it out, it turns out it was gold. They made their way back to Bannock as they intended, except that it wasn't now with the same purpose. They went back for supplies. All the weariness of the journey, all the difficulties they had experienced, now it's in the past. We found what we were looking for. And so when that happened, then they, um, they, they got back. But before they, they actually arrived, they um, talked amongst themselves, and they got their plan together. And, and okay, now we're not going to tell a soul. We can't trust anybody. This is our find. And it's only for us. So just, you know, you go get the shovels and you go get this and that and whatever all they had to get, you know. Maybe buy some more ponies. You, you go take care of what you have to take care of. But, you know, we'll just spread out. Everybody just go on and act nonchalant. Nobody's to know. We won't tell anybody that we found gold. And so that's what they did. And they, and they fulfilled it. They, they, uh, everybody kept mum. They, they didn't share it with anybody. And they met back up at the 
the uh, starting point that they had agreed upon to head back. And 300 men were ready to join them. Who spilled the beans? Who, who told? Who didn't keep your word? Oh, they all had. But what they couldn't hide was the shine on their faces. And people could see there's something going on. I'm going with them. And I'd like to use that just to kind of remind us people can see whether we've been with God. We, we might not even realize we're telling anybody. We might not even, you know, everything just kind of goes on like normal. But, you know, people can tell what's real. And people can tell whenever you're really seeking after God and trying to do what he wants you to do and his presence has, has been with you and you're, you're, you're basking in his presence. People can tell. And so this morning, could we just have the prayer, Lord, show us your glory. Don't let us go from this point without your presence. Don't let us try anything without you. It's not about my own schemes and plans and programs and all the rest of the things that we can come up with. No, no, Lord, don't take us from here unless your presence goes with us. Help us to know that closeness of your presence day by day. If we're going to have it, it's going to require an in-depth inspection of our own heart. It's going to require an individual investment on our part. And it's going to result in an inescapable identity. People will see when you've been with Jesus. Will you commit to that this morning? Will you just say, Lord, that's what I want. I don't want to, I don't want to be unfamiliar or uncomfortable in your presence, but I want to know the closeness that Moses had. I want you to be able to come and just touch me. I want, in a sense, not that we literally are asking to see, see God in the flesh, but, but Lord, I want to see you. I want you to meet with me. I want to know that your voice has spoken to my heart. I want to shine for you. God, help that to be reality in our own hearts. We're coming right up on revival. Let's pray that God would just move on us in such a special way, not just the person across the aisle, but the person sitting in your spot this morning. Your own heart. Let's pray that God would really move among us, that we sense and know his glory.